Brought to you by ConnectJS, Atlanta's premier JavaScript conference. Sponsored in part by FeatherDirect. Need a mobile app? Contact us for your custom mobile solution. Um, this talk is called Adventures in Cross Platform. It's really just um, talking about some experiences that I've had developing apps with Titanium, um, mainly iOS and Android, and just some gotchas that I've come across, the experiences of the way I approach development, dealing with clients, payments, publications to the app stores and things like that. A little bit about me, I'm a freelance app developer based in Wiltshire in the UK, I work from home, I have a TARDIS, uh, which is going to be a loo, it's being converted to an office loo. Um, married with four kids who uh, interrupt me constantly. Um, I'm a Titan, so I'm one of the community Titans that are an advocate of the platform. Also certified um, as a TCE and a trainer um, of Titanium as well. And I'm not ashamed to say I'm a fanboy of Titanium. It pays my way, it pays for my office, it pays for my TARDIS. So I, I'm, I'm a, a promoter and an advocate of the platform. And I've used other platforms as well, like PhoneGap and Zumerian, so I've, I'm not blinkered to other things that are out there but Titanium is my, uh, my choice for developing mobile. Um, just a quick example of some recent apps that I've been working on with Titanium. So, oh, I missed a slide. So I'm gonna let me go back. There we go, oh no, oh, I've got some silly animation going on. Anyway, um, I developed the app for the Stonehenge Audio Tour. So Stonehenge in the UK went through a huge um, rebuild of the visitor centre and part of that was to develop, they wanted an app that people could download and go around when they do the audio tour. So I developed an app for iOS and Android to do that, that was downloaded um, from the app store and then downloads um, JSON data and audio data remotely from the local server. I also built an app called the Great British Beacon, which was for Android and iOS again, had quite a unique user interface. Um, and it was featured on a program called BBC Springwatch and on, on the news channels in the UK. And it was all about the diminishing of the bees around the world. And so they were trying to promote people to get outside, take photos, discover bees, look at the different types of bees, and submit all that to a central server, which would then do a count of those bees. Um, and they could, then uh, they could then go into the research for Friends of the Earth who were paying for the app. So that was quite a fun project to do. So things I've learnt and I'm still learning. First thing's clients. How, how many people here are freelance? Okay, cool. So you'll, you'll, you'll get some, uh, you'll understand these next slides. They all start somewhere, and usually with an inquiry. So these are some real inquiries that I get, or had. We'd like an app like Instagram, can you price it? Can you give me a time scale? The best one I like was the Twitter one. It's like Twitter, but location-based. Uh, or people with a Flash app that they want wrapped in a native app and then put in the App Store. And the best one, basically, is just our website and an app. And so these are the typical inquiries you've got to deal with. So one of the things I've learned when I'm pricing apps is to break down the costs. I fell into a trap in the, my very first commercial app that I did I bundled the price together, did iOS and Android, put the whole price together as one thing, we started development, typically on iOS at the time, this was several years ago. And midway through the project, they abandoned the Android app. And of course, their perception was, I gave a price, I did two apps, or I gave a price for two apps, split down the middle, pay me for half of the work done. Not understanding that with Titanium, 80, 90% of the work you've done is common to both. So through my own, failing really, I, I missed out on an opportunity. So what I do now is I break down the costs. So I make sure that I split the, the apps down by pricing, uh, by function, by platform. Um, I put in core cost for the development of the 80% functionality that's gonna be shared between Android and iOS. And then I put together pricing for the UE for iOS and Android. I include costs for the builds, the beta distributions, and any redistributions that I need to do in terms of testing, and obviously the App Store submissions and possible resubmissions. I've had probably two apps, I think, that got rejected because of certain ways that the app had been, uh, certain functionality in the app that needed to be changed. So I need to factor in that sort of thing. 
And the other thing I'm really careful of now is dealing with third parties, specifically API developers. Um, not that they're bad or anything, but obviously that's another factor in the app that you've got to worry about. As far as the client's concerned, they launch the app, the app breaks, you know, something's wrong with your code. What they don't, might not realize is the API might have changed, or there might be something else to deal with. And when you're dealing with fixed price projects like I have been, that's a difficult one to factor in because you can't anticipate issues with the API. They're going to, going to take up three hours of your time to try and solve. The other challenge is with design. We love designers. But typically, in my experience, most of the ones I've dealt with use Apple devices. They usually come from the print background, from the web background, from mobile web, res responsive web, and don't really understand mobile devices, mainly because they stick with one device type. They don't understand the differences between the UE conventions, navigation, tab groups, action bars on Android, and things like that. And they always think that a tiny change is really easy. Give me a load of images to update, and it's five minute change to do it, but you know, they might not have given me all the densities, it might need to be restructured into the correct folder structure for the app and obviously deployed, tested and everything else. So what I do, oh so, sorry, this is uh, some of the things that I get asked by designers. So I'd like tab group from iOS on Android. This was a good one. They were talking about the app icon, which they called the app avatar. Wanted a quick button in iOS, the five minute jobs, and also giving me retina images that are named differently than the normal conventions of the app two times because they didn't know any different. So what I try and do now is educate. This is the typical design that I might get through. They reference PSDs, so they wanted me to go into PSD files and get images out of PSDs. Uh, PSDs. They're giving me point sizes for fonts. In some cases, not in this example, they're giving me odd numbers for retina images. Not understanding that obviously you know they give me a two times image that's an odd number and I have to I have to halve that down and you can't split the pixels so what I do is try and work with them to help them understand the differences between the platforms and understand the differences understand what I need from them in terms of being a developer so I explain the differences with navigation and tab groups explain what an action bar is explain the fact that Android you know has a back button whether it's a physical back button on the older devices or, or a software back button now and what that means in terms of navigation. Show them examples of sites with some of the new material design and some of the new navigation types with Android. So they actually start understanding the differences and, and don't just give me an iOS design and say we want that in Android. And one of the things I do with the images now, and I'll come back to some images stuff in a minute, is I'll end up giving them the file structure. I'll create that folder structure in Titanium um, with all the HD uh, DPI images and everything else that is required, and then I'll give that to them so that they can alter those images in place, so they have an understanding of what the structure is. But you can't always win, and I end up in situations where they want the tab group. It's part of the design, it's part of the app, they want something that's sort of non-Android, non-Android UE, they want that iOS element in Android, and, and sometimes you just can't win. Testing is usually fun, Android, this is an up-to-date chart that I got the other day. We're obviously dealing with different density types, different devices, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 plus devices at the last count, I can't even remember now. Multiple versions, it's getting better now in terms of the versions that are out there. And what I call crapware, which is the, I had to buy a couple of devices from HTC and Samsung because of the extra theming that they install on the devices, which was messing up some of the fields with the titanium app that I was building, which didn't happen on any other Android device, didn't happen on Jenny Motion, but on a specific series of Samsung devices, the fields were black. And so I had to literally just go and buy a Samsung device from Amazon to test it and fix the problem. So you can't test everything in the emulator, in the simulators. You need to have some physical devices. Obviously you can't have 6,000, but I do buy, a I do have a series of devices on my desk, which are usually at 0%, and I have to charge them up each time, um, that have these different attributes, a tablet, an HDPI device, an XXHD DPI device, just so I can test these different things out. But one of the big changes I made recently, which has helped me no end, is just restricting the versions that I work with now. So I only do Android 4 and above. Obviously with, the, the, with Titanium and iOS, especially with the new um, iOS 8 SDK, it's supporting 7 and 8. With 7 it was 6 and 7, so that's, that's nicely limited as well. So that makes my job a lot easier. And obviously, you know, Android's fragmented, and iOS isn't, is it? 
except it sort of is getting there. It's not as bad, but now we've got you know the 3.5 device, the 3.5 inch non-retina devices are hopefully slowly disappearing. So we're, we're, we're going to be stuck, or say stuck, but we're going to have the retina images to work with. But now we've got new devices. We've got new screen sizes. Um, we've got iPads. We've got iPhone 6s. And, you know, it's becoming more interesting to test on iOS now. And retina and retina HD as well. Deployment, when I'm building, I tend to build now uh, by doing iterative builds and then giving that to the customer. And one of the best ways I can do that is using products like Installer. So I used to use TestFlight before they got bought by Apple, and then obviously dropped the Android support. Um, and Installer is an awesome tool written by a guy called Jeff Bones. I'm just trying to find my notes on here because this screen setup has thrown me slightly. There we go. Um, and what Installer does, which is really unique, that there's a slight issue with iOS 8 at the moment, which they're fixing. But what Installer does is it allows you to do real-time provisioning updates. So once they fix this iOS 8 issue, it will go back to normal, but at the moment it works a bit like test flight. But essentially the concept is, I build an app, I sign it with a provisioning profile on iOS with my device, I upload it to Installer, and what Installer does is when I send the invites out to the users and they register their device, it changes the provisioning profile in the development portal. It then updates the provisioning profile on their device and allows them to download and install the app. So I don't have to take their UUID and add it into the portal and then re-download the provisioning profile and re-import it and regenerate the, the app and send it to them. It happens all over the air. New devices can get added. Now you've got to be careful with it, that's the only problem, because if you don't, if you just freely allow people to add devices, they can just keep adding an iPad, and I've had one customer that added their iPad 2, iPad 3, a couple of iPhones, and all my device numbers are going down. So you can change it to, for you to give permission. And then when that happens, you get a little request in and you can say, yes, you know, I want to let this person give, a, uh, give this person access. But it will still do the over-the-air provisioning, which is really cool. But like I said, there's one issue at the moment with iOS 8, which has stopped this over-the-air um, changing of the provisioning profile. And they're they've got a fix that they're working on, and then it will get back to normal. But what are the key things I do when I'm, is this going to advance through? There we go. Um, one of the key things I do now when it's time to go live is make sure that I use client accounts, client app store accounts. Sounds simple, but sometimes you get clients who need an app done, they haven't sorted out their development account, they want to use yours, and you can get into a little bit of a nightmare sometimes with clients where they're wondering, well, why is your name appearing next to the app? Well, is it your copyright, my copyright? It gets very confusing. So I make sure I only use client developer accounts, get them to do the iTunes Connect settings where they have to approve certain things, legal things about the app. You, don't, you might not want to do that yourself. Um, and obviously advising them on review time so they don't think they can just publish it and get it live tomorrow morning. Most importantly, I make sure I get paid. I do offer a warranty for the work that I do so that when it goes live there's a warranty period, but it's important to make sure I get paid because if, this is, if it's an app that's making money for them, it's making money while I still haven't got money in the bank. The other thing, a uh, challenge with Android is Google Play limitations. So this is something I hit with the B app because they had some animations in there and the animations were high res, we were dealing with multiple devices, Android, loads of densities, it turned out to be a 51 meg, 52 meg app. The app limit in the Play Store is 50 meg unless you use expansion files. Um, expansion files are these OBB files, they're essentially zip files and they're um, files that can get downloaded from the Apple Play, uh, Apple Play, Google Play um, Store via the licensing service after the app's installed. The problem with um, up until a few weeks ago is that Titanium didn't support expansion files. So I've actually had a module built, which is on that URL there in my GitHub repo, which is an Android module that supports OBB files. So now you can have a two gig file, one gig file, whatever you want as your OBB file and download that after your app is installed from the Play Store. It's asynchronous, it gives you progress and it lets you then access the resources in that file directly just using straight um, JavaScript. Emulation is the other big issue, or has been. If you're using the Android SDK emulator, this is your life, basically. It is the worst emulator experience ever. It, titanium has got blamed for a lot of things including 
not working with Android because of this emulator. The app doesn't reinstall, the app doesn't fire, you have to delete the app, you have to restart the emulator, and, and Titanium gets the blame for it, and it's, the emulator just sucks, basically. It's an ARM emulator trying to run on Intel hardware, and it's very slow. There are some workarounds you can do by running an Intel image, but ultimately, I use Jenny Motion. It's, it's free, there's a paid version that gives you a few extra features. It's really fast, it's an Intel-based image, so it's very, very fast on Macs. Um, I haven't used it on Windows, I've seen it running on Windows. Um, you can hack it, and uh, when I say hack, you drag and drop a file and reboot the device, and essentially you get Google Play and the Google APIs, which has always been missing from the Intel images. So you can actually go to the Play Store and download games, download apps, download your live app, download other apps, download the Twitter app, and actually use them like a device. And it runs as fast as a device, you can run YouTube and things like that. It's really impressive. It's got some good GPS and mapping tools for testing GPS. And it, it sort of you know, makes it possible. I've, I've done apps now where I've started with Android. I've been working with the Android emulator rather than iOS because it just makes it a much, more, a much, much nicer experience. The other tool I use, or two tools, are Live View and TI Shadow. So I know Fock has already covered some of these already, or covered um, uh, TI Shadow, and yeah, he's covered both of these already in the, in the CLI talk. These tools are great. Um, again, if you're building apps with Titanium and you're hitting the build button and waiting two minutes for it to build if it's a big app, it's just a nightmare to do a simple change, to do a simple fix. TI Shadow and Live View will let you see those changes almost immediately with a quick restart of the app. Um, uh, TI Shadow works on multiple devices, Live View doesn't currently, so with TI Shadow you can actually have um, an iOS simulator, Jenny Motion, and because of the way that Xcode 6 and 5 can run together, you can actually run an old school 7 simulator and a new school 8 simulator at the same time and have all these devices um, running the app via TI Shadow. Make changes, see those changes almost instantly with a quick restart. There are a few issues. You have to be careful of event handlers that are tied to the app or GPS, anything like that. You can get into a mess because if you've got a GPS event handler going on, doing location changes, and then you do a change and it restarts, the old, the old event handler will still be running. And you can end up with what you think is a bug in your app, and it turns out you've got two GPS location handlers firing, causing all kinds of weird things to go on. So in some cases, if you start getting into weird issues and find bugs, do a restart, rebuild, and it usually resolves those things if they're related to global events. So it makes it a much, much nicer experience working with titanium. The other thing I use is alloy. So we refer to titanium, the classic titanium now, the sort of classic way of coding with JavaScript only, but Alloy is, and again, I know this has been covered a little bit, but I've just got one slide. Alloy separates the concerns so that you've got models, views, and control controllers. It's an MVC model. It just makes laying out screens and working with views much, much nicer, easier, makes reusability better, and it's just, it, it creates tighter, um, easier to maintain apps. I'm not getting all my slides coming up at the right time. There we go. So you've got selectors where you can use conditional code to say, am I on iOS and Android? You can exclude certain styles or certain elements of your app, certain code that's going to run. And the nice thing about Alloy is that it will not include that stuff in the build. So if you've got a whole view that isn't required on Android, it won't be in the Android build. Whereas with traditional type titanium, when you're doing conditions, that code is running. That code, all of that code for iOS and Android is still in the same app, and it's just running based on whichever platform it's running on. It uses TSS files, which are not like CSS. It's more like just properties, but basically allow you to separate all your designs, all your styles out, um, set images, set widths and properties of objects separate from the JavaScript code. So it makes things a lot easier. Dealing with platforms and screens. So one of the things I do now when I'm using Alloy is, and I, I'm doing an app at the moment for a recruitment startup, I spend a, quite a bit of time initially just creating all the styles. So with the app.tss file, I basically create all my classes. So you can sort of see a couple there um, where I've created one called Tight which uses TIUE size to bring any views tight so you don't get that issue of the views filling the screen. Um, I might have styles for fonts, for colors, for rounding buttons, uh, button corners and things like that. I create all those styles and lay out the UE elements on the screen so that I can 
see what a slide is going to look like, see what the buttons are going to look like, test that in both Android and iOS before I've even written any JavaScript. And the beauty of doing that is that when I then come to lay out the XML files, all I'm doing is assigning those classes. And I know that it's already going to work in Android and iOS because I've already tested that. So it means you can lay out the screen in iOS, fire it up in Android, and it looks exactly as you expected it because you've already done that legwork. So there's a simple example there at the bottom with a button, and I'm just setting it to wide, green, rounded, and that's just going to make a full width button, green background, rounded corners. Just lay out those classes. And there's no overhead in, in putting as many classes as you want in there because Alloy essentially pre compiles or pre-processes the code into normal titanium before it's built. So this isn't happening at runtime. It's doing all those properties before the app is actually run. And with some of these techniques, I'm finding it a lot easier now to deal with, especially the new apps, the, sorry, the new devices, the iPhone 6. So the, the app I'm working at the moment, I actually launched it in the iPhone 6 simulator and it actually worked. <laughs> and it looked fine and there was no fixed widths or 320 widths that I put in there because one of the things that I'm doing now as well is using fixed anchor points. And so I saw a tweet a few weeks ago, there was a conference going on, and someone tweeted this, that, sorry, that um, type is the one constant across all screen sizes. And it is if you don't include top, left, bottom and right. Now obviously wearables, round screens, you know, slightly different, but on all of these different screens that I'm dealing with, there's always a top left, there's always a bottom right. And so if I anchor things around those points, they're going to scale, they're going to work. And obviously percentages you can use as well. So one of the things I've, I'm doing is I'm building flexible layouts. I'm using top left, bottom right. I'm avoiding using fixed widths. Gone are the days now where you could assume that every iPhone used a DP width of 320 and you could get away with it. Can't do that anymore. Um, using TI, TIUE size, if you're familiar with the um, constants, TIUE size makes something as big as the contents that it, create, it contains. TIUE fill fills the parent element that that element is inside. So using those techniques, you can avoid using fixed pixels. You can avoid typing in 320 and, and, and make things that are going to scale to these bigger screens. And part of that is using DPs, density pixels. And this is one of the things that designers, some designers don't get. They don't understand the difference. And so density pixels, if you're unfamiliar, are the pixels that allow you to specify a distance of an object or, or a width of something, and the device or the, the SDK will take care of the translation of that to the underlying real pixels. If you were to do something in Android using uh, turning off density pixels and just using normal pixels, then effectively everything you were doing would be bunched up in the corner of the screen. Density pixels make sure that it looks consistent on the different densities. Percentages and also dynamic buttons. One of the things I get when I'm doing um, apps is obviously designers will send me um, image-based buttons. They'll use a standard font, Helvetica or whatever. They'll create an image and then give me all those buttons. And I end up with density, non-density, and have to generate all the Android assets. And I've got 200 images for one button. When I could just have the font and the color and do the rounding myself, and I've got a dynamic button that takes up virtually no memory. So that's, that's one thing I try and do as well. And also density on Android with titanium can be very, very granular. If you look at some of the documentation, you can end up with about 30 folders. Not long, long, portrait, landscape, all kinds of different configurations. So I keep it really simple. Keep it down to the, the core densities um, and just you know, make sure that I've got that file structure in place. Keep it really simple and use retina images as my XHDPI. There's almost a one-to-one -one match between XHDPI and retina. And then one of the techniques that I use is Tycons, which um, Fokker mentioned. So using the command line of the Tycons um, service that he's written to actually take those retina images and generate all of the other density images for Android. So with one set of retina images, I get all of my density folders done. And it just makes, makes the job a lot easier. Obviously for the XX and the XXX, it's going to scale stuff up. But the beauty of that then is you end up with a folder structure that you can give to the designer. So here's my folder structure with all my images. You can replace all these images now with your high-res versions, your crisp versions. Just use the same files, same names, same footprint of the image, and I can just swap it straight over. So XHDPI uh, maps to um, normal non-retina images. XXHDPI uh, is, let me just see, yeah, 1.5, um, and, and I think, I can't remember what the uh, times three was. I think it was XXX or something. Um, 
Nine patch Im images is the other technique I use. So this is, a, this is something I only discovered for a year ago or something. Um, there's a tool built into the Android SDK that lets you build nine patch images. These are scalable backgrounds. So if you've ever used titanium with left cap, top cap, where you can take an image and stretch it to any button size, this is effectively giving you the same type of thing. So you, you can have a, a background image that represents the curvature of a button, just as a 50 by 50 or 100 by 100 image, and reuse that for different size buttons. You can also do that for splash screens. Uh, and again, Tycons will take care of doing your app, your, um, app icon generation and your splash screen generation using nine patch. So you get a really optimized set of images for Android. The next thing is optimization. Android has always, I don't want to say suffered, but it's always been different from iOS in terms of how much stuff you can throw at, at, at the screen. With iOS, you, see, you throw views into tables and list views and um, th uh, views and buttons and labels on the screen, and iOS seems to eat it up, and Android can suffer. So I tend to be really, really careful with Android, and obviously that helps um, iOS as well. Reduce the amount of views that I'm using, reduce the amount of nested views, especially when you're sort of nesting views together for no real reason and using them a bit liberally like divs in, in HTML. Keep things really simple. Try and use list views instead of table views. If, you've, if you're using a table view and you're putting 100 rows of data in it and it's got a label and an image, that could be 800 calls to the API underneath the Titanium SDK. And that's 800 over the bridge calls, we call them. And they're slow, especially if it's doing that every time it's rendering the page. With a, with a list view, you're creating the data, you're creating the template, you're passing the two things to the, to the SDK and saying put them together. And it does that in one call. So you get much faster, smoother native performance with list views and table views. And they're really easy to integrate now with Alloy as well. Instruments is an awesome tool on iOS for checking for memory leaks. Oh, on, ta on um, table views, oh, it's, yeah, it's a bit redundant now with list views, but table views, if you, when you create a table view row, if you set a class name and just call it something that's consistent across all those rows. So if all your rows look the same and it was a news list, you just call it news. It doesn't matter what you call it. But as long as it's the same for all those rows, then what happens is when new rows come in, it doesn't overthink the layout. It doesn't relay out those rows as they come in. It just assumes that the layout is similar to the previous one. And it speeds up the layout of the rows coming in. And you can actually visibly see this in, a, you know, in an Android app. If you, if, you t if you don't have the class name in there, and you're scrolling table view, it can be a bit jumpy as you're going up. And if you just add the class name and redo it, it goes smoother. But it goes super smooth with list view because list view is fully happening on the other side of the bridge. So with instruments, this is awesome at finding memory leaks. Um, I won't, I'm not going to go into the full detail of how to do it now. It's almost a separate thing. It's probably something we can put on TI Dev. But instruments is, is amazing for finding leaks in your apps that will eventually lead them to crash. And again, this is a thing that iOS seems to deal with. It allows you to have these memory leaks. It lets you get away with them forever, almost, until one day your app will just quit and you don't, didn't know why. Android doesn't let you get away with it that easily. And usually your app will launch, you'll open a couple of screens and it will die. Instruments is great at finding where those leaks are. They're usually associated with events and they're usually associated with global events that are attached to local objects within your particular screen. And what that ends up doing is it doesn't allow you to close those screens fully. The elements in those screens stay alive. And if you've got an element in the screen staying alive, it's keeping the screen alive. And if there's other things linked to that, you've got a memory leak. There's a great video by Rick Lullock called Your Apps Are Leaking. It's old, it's a few years old now, but it's still relevant. And he goes through some example code on how to um, create memory leaks, you know, the, the classic ways that they happen and how to solve them. And Instruments is a great way of finding those memory leaks and, and just nailing them before you go any further. And it's obviously going to help with Android because you're sharing the code base. <laughs> Scrollable views is a bit of an under, underrated um, UE element of Titanium. And I use this in the B app. So with the B app, it had quite a custom interface. It didn't use a tab group. It didn't use a navigation group. But we wanted a consistent interface between the two. And so what I did was put the navigation in scrollable views. So if you're not familiar with it, scrollable view is the view that you sort of slide horizontally and go through elements. And I basically used a two-stage scrollable view to handle navigation um, so that I had my list of data, if you like, 
you click on an item and it would scroll in the next it would scroll in the detail the article if you were reading a news list or something like that the beauty of using that technique is that it's you've got stack management built in because it takes care of it for you but also it's the performance is really fast on iOS and Android because it's using the native control so you get a really nice smooth animation in on Android that you don't have to do manually in JavaScript it's also really nice if you use the technique of doing all your styles first because you can basically prototype all your screens. So I have all my views and all my alloy screens laid out on a scrollable view and the client can just scroll view, scroll through the view and see all those different screens and UA elements almost like a prototype and, and get that approved before I go any further. There's also a, a little technique in alloy called base controllers. So uh, Alloy has controllers and views. Controllers is the JavaScript code behind the view, and the view is XML based. I won't go into models at this stage. But one of the things that you can do with the controller is you can have a base controller, and it's effectively a simple form of inheritance. So you can take a controller, you can effectively inherit another controller, and it inherits all the code, it inherits the view, and all the attributes of that controller, but as a completely separate instance. And you can then override and add extra view elements using your new controller. It's a pretty cool way of reusing some existing views and code that you've already done. That was one of the first methods I used to do sort of reusability. And then I moved with the later versions of Alloy. I think it was 1.4 they added it. Uh, it might be one, no, it was 1.4. They added the ability to have um, nested widgets, uh, you know, widgets with uh, nested content inside them, but also nested require tags. So the require tag in Alloy allows you to require in another view. And what you can now do is open that require tag up and actually have content inside it. So you can effectively create a, ta a template wrapper that wraps around your content. And that wrapper could have navigation, it could have tab group, it could have header and footer, it could have all of those attributes that you might have shared across the app. It's a simpler way of doing it than, than using the normal Alloy widgets. But one of the cool things that you can do in Alloy, which I've been playing with, is you can create your own tags. So Alloy has a, an attribute. You can see, a, I'll, I'll bring up a, a better view in a minute, but you can sort of see some Alloy code at the bottom there, it's some XML. So there's a, an attribute of Alloy elements called module. And if you specify a module and give it a name, then it looks in your lib folder of the Titanium project for that module, for that common JS module, and it will invoke, essentially try and invoke the typical TI, UE, create view functionality in that module. So it will call that module first, looking to create that element, which means you get the ability to, it, to intercept the creation of that view, that table view, that navigation group, that button, and do things differently. You can create a different element completely. And as long as you return something that it expects, and most things are based on view, so you can usually return a view and it will work, you can then customize that object. You can make it cross-platform. You could create your own slide menu. You could do all kinds of things. So here's an example of a slide menu that I've done for the, the job app. And it's just alloy tags. But, it, but I've created a brand new um, tag called slide menu. I'm referencing a module called UE. So in my lib folder, there's a, a file called UE.js. And that has a, an exported method in there called create slide view, uh, create slide menu. So alloy goes to that file calls create slide menu, and again, for the left menu and the right menu, it does the same thing. And I then take control and generate my slide menu. So the XML is really simple. You drop in the XML, you give it, I give it a root window, which is the, the main tab group that I'm working with as the, as the main view or, the, or a navigation group. And then I give it a, I use a require function to pull in the left and right menus, which are just normal titanium views. And what you end up with is a slide menu. So this is it when it's open. I didn't want to show it when it's closed because it's got the app name on there and I don't really want to show that at the moment. Um, but it's basically a slide menu and the app itself has a slide menu on the left and the right that do different functionality. And when you click the little hamburger icon, it slides left or right based on which menu is going to show. Um, it's really simple. All the code is being done in the JavaScript so the user doesn't have to worry about it. They just have to drop the XML in um, and the events are all handled automatically by the um, UE.js file. So I've also got a demo. I didn't have the guts to do a live demo, so I'm going to show you a demo in a second of a tab group on Android and how you can use the module attribute to change the tab group functionality. So before I do that, I'll just go through a couple of other examples. So 
Some of the things you could use it for, title control is an alloy tag that only works on iOS, it doesn't work on Android, um, and it'll get ignored on Android. But you could create your own title control tag that works on Android. It, on iOS, it'll just return a normal title control and everything's fine. But on Android, you could have it create a view, and you could then have it create a, or contain a label, and you could create your own left button and right button tag so that you can actually have a, an XML view that looks exactly the same on iOS and Android in terms of the XML, but behaves differently under the, uh, behind the scenes because of the platform that it's on. Checkbox, you could create your own checkbox control, slide menu you've seen, attributed string is a classic one. I'm, I'm still trying to crack that one, but I'm getting there. Uh, but you do have to be careful with some of these. If you start putting events in those um, files, in those ue.js file in this example, you've got to make sure you clean those events up afterwards, otherwise you can create your own leak, you can create more leaks. So this next demo is a recording that basically shows, I'll just bring the screen up, but I won't start it yet, hopefully. Okay, so this is basically uh, an Android tab group. Now, it looks like an action bar, but the implementation in Titanium is with the tab group um, tag. And if you use that in Android by default, you will get an action bar interface with three tabs. Obviously on iOS, it appears normally at the bottom as a normal tab group. So, in this example, it's going to be really difficult for me to see this, but we'll see if this works, if I can talk this through. So we've got normal tabs in Android, you can click between them, we've got the labels, it's just a default project. And if I click that, it opens a new window. The return button works as you'd expect in Android. And it behaves exactly as it would by default. But if we take the code, and we just add this extra module, Let's see what's going on. You can see the attribute that's being added is exactly the same tab group code. Nothing else has changed. We've just added this one module attribute to the tab group and the window. Go back to the emulator, save it, it will hot reload it, and we've gone now to what looks like an iOS tab group, but it's based on the same default functionality. All of those labels still work, they still open the views just like they did before. It, and there's a dodgy next button, I put, a back button I put in there just by default. But essentially, it's behaving very much like an iOS tab group, looking like an iOS tab group, but on Android, with one change, just one attribute change. No other code change at all. So summary, separate costs. Make sure I break down costs. Core costs for developing, integrating with the API, the core functionality between the apps, the app UEs for iOS and Android. And remember with Android, you've got all those devices and everything. Help the designers, you're their only hope, to understand mobile and get away from print and point sizes. Test on real devices, buy everything you can. It's tax deductible if you work for yourself, so it's not a big deal. Uh, but just make sure you've got enough charging points to charge everything, otherwise you end up waiting half an hour for something to come back to life. Flexible layouts, avoid constants, use the device info. So I didn't mention that earlier, but obviously you can, you can get the device info, call that once at the beginning of the app and stick that somewhere that's available in Alloy Globals or somewhere in a common JS module that you can recall um, so you know the width of the device and all those different um, properties. Use Jenny Motion. If, you, if you're not using Jenny Motion, doing Titanium and you're working on Android, you're just killing yourself. So definitely use Jenny Motion. Um, deliver apps over the air, installer, obviously there's other services like Hockey App that do a similar thing. Use Alloy, um, you don't have to, but I find it enables me to put views together really fast, especially if I do that groundwork with the, the app.tss and all my classes. Um, you know, I can lay out some of these screens really easily, especially things like forms. So like form captions, form labels, you can just literally just drop these text fields in, apply the class, you can even attach, um, you can even redefine the text field uh, you know, as a, as a, as in the, in the app.tss as an object, so that every text field just defaults to looking exactly as you want it to look. And testing apps for memory leaks. Really, really easy one to forget and to look over um, because your app seems to be working, behaving itself. But if there is a memory leak in there, you'll find out on Android really, really quickly. And the final thing is just reiterating one of the things that Fokker mentioned tidev.io is a site that we created as a sort of community. Really, really cool site, full of, it's obviously free and free to access, but it's full of news articles, titanium news, advice, tips, 
really good blog posts about how to get more out of titanium and tricks and tips. Um, there's some great stuff posted recently. Fokker posted some stuff about how to avoid memory leaks by cleaning up controllers. Um, so really, really cool site and it's worth checking out. And that's me done. With five minutes to go, I think. Ten minutes to go. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it depends. So the question was about classic. Has anyone heard of it? If you've got a classic app, do you maintain it? Do you bring it up to speed in Alloy, rewrite it, and how do you do that? So it depends which SDK it was built with. Because anything that's been built like pre 3.2, Titanium 3.2, so 3.14, those sort of projects, they're going to be a nightmare to work with anyway now because of all the changes. Um, you know, map changes going to 3.2. There's heavyweight window changes with Android going to 3.2 and 3.3. So 3.3 now, you can't, you know, every, every window in Android is heavyweight. Um, TI include is gone in 3.4. So apps are not going to work if they've got TI include. So it really depends what state the SDK is in. If it's a, if it's a classic app that's written in CommonJS and it was able to be translated up, it really depends on what needs to be done with it. The nice thing about Alloy and Titanium is that Alloy, is, Alloy generates Titanium. So there's, you know, whilst Alloy is great for, for building apps really quickly, sometimes you might just write a bit of classic Titanium in there to create a view or a button that you need without going through all of the Alloy code, because you could do that and you can mix and match. So there's no reason why you couldn't partially convert an app as you go over to Alloy. You know, you could, especially if, if it's been nicely separated already, if there's lots of modules that are already doing API integration and all that stuff, they're going to stay exactly the same. It's just your UE that's going to change. So you could, you could create a new, I mean, I would probably, yeah, create a new branch. I'd create an Alloy app. I'd start bringing in files, you know, bring all, all the assets and all the common JS files because they're going to be fine. Bring all those into that new project and then just start introducing other files and views as I go, and then look at what could be rewritten and what could be separated out. And you know, most of the time, if you look, it's, it, people work differently, obviously, but traditionally, if you look at a, a traditional titanium app that someone's done where they haven't used a sort of MVC type model, they usually got their JS at the top that's defining their controls, and they'll usually, for their own sanity, do it in a relevant order. So they'll create a window, then they'll create the view, then they might create the elements inside that view, and then they'll add it to that view, and then they'll add the view to the window. So there's a sort of logic that helps you debug that more easily. So in, in theory, you should be able to take that, put that into it, generate the view for that, and then just add the dollar and reassign a couple of variables down below and then get everything working again. It's not simple and, and quick, but it's certainly not a nightmare if the original code is in a, a good state. But if it is an old SDK, then there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.